Good afternoon, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome from the Wall Street School to each one of you. Allow me to very quickly introduce myself. I am Shilpi Jain, ACCA Managing Partner for all the accounting courses at the Wall Street School. Today, we are going to start with part two of the CMA qualification. And for that, we have with us a very esteemed, a very renowned, a very, you know, somebody who has a very long lineage of rich industry as well as teaching experience along with him. And that is Mr. Muzil Kazim Nazir. He is by qualification a qualified US CMA, AICWA, CFM, as well as BSc. Has an industrious career behind him, which is of over 25 years. Now, before I hand over the session to Mr. Kazim, let me very quickly set some housekeeping rules for the class. So how we are going to proceed for this session is that Mr. Kazim will be there and he will be teaching you, guiding you throughout your entire CMA journey. So utilize these live sessions. Make sure you ask lots and lots of queries to him so that the concepts are crystal clear before we actually go ahead. Now, the, you know, the ideology of coming to the live class is to make sure that you are exam ready. And that will happen with a lot of progress tests being conducted during the classes. You know, once a little, you know, a little portion of the class has been done, we will be assessing you on your performance. And then only we will go ahead with the remaining concepts. So that is going to make sure that, yes, the concepts studied so far are ready with you. Now, some of you have already enrolled for the CMA qualification. Some of you who have joined in today are you know, still looking out and judging and kind of, you know, doing their homework with respect to the CMA qualification. And that is an extremely important thing to do. Certainly, you are investing in your career. So you must do your thorough homework in terms of the payback that the qualification is going to give to you. So certainly, let me just give you, you know, very quick numbers to help you make that decision quicker. So as per IMA's Global Salary Survey 2023, qualified CMAs are earning 41% more than their non-certified peers. So that is the kind of advantage that this qualification is going to bring to you. So by all means, I think we are all ready to hand over the session to Mr. Kazim. A very warm welcome on behalf of the Wall Street School. So over to you, Mr. Kazim. Thank you, Shilpi. Thanks for the introduction. So uh, I will start the session right now and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome all of you to this master class on CMA part two. So first of all, uh, I should tell you about the course. Is it an easy course or is it going to be a difficult one, right? So if you want an idea about that, well, it is not going to be very easy. At the same time, it's not so difficult like the Indian professional courses. You know the Indian professional courses. They have a percentage, passing percentage, maybe in single digits and some sometimes double digits, right? 10 to 15 percent probably, the CA and the Indian CMA. Those courses have more subjects, are more intense, more difficult, right? Uh, but CMA, US, uh, I wouldn't say it's easy. I wouldn't say it's easy at all because let me just share some of the data with you. Can all of you all see this screen? Yes, it's very much visible. Yes, yes. Okay. So I'm just showing you the passing percentages, right, of this course. You should look at the blue one, the worldwide results. Okay, this is some time back, but still the same trend continues. 
This is for part one CMA and part two CMA. As you can see, I don't know why, but part two CMA shows slightly better results than part one. Okay, I really don't know the reason, uh, but it's equally difficult like part one, but it shows some better results. But part one shows a 35%. It might have got worse now. This is some, as I told you, this is a little bit of, little bit outdated data, but still, it would have, it will get more tougher as time goes, right? So thirty-five percent passing. Why is this? Because of some theory subjects like internal control and technology, etc., which is actually quite difficult to score. Now, in part one, in part two. You have section A, which is ratio analysis. You can score in this subject. Section B, corporate finance, is a little tough because it's quite vast. Section C, the cost accounting, it's tested more in the exam. The maximum weightage is section C. Section D is a very small section, which you can uh, study very fast and it has a, a, quite a less weightage basically. And then section E is capital budgeting, little tough. It's not going to be that easy. Section F is the only theoretical subject here, which is ethics, professional ethics. Don't underestimate this, right? It, is, uh, it, it also has a significant weightage and yeah, a lot of theory would be there, but all application based. So in my view, section A and section C is just scoring. But section C, they would make it more tough because this is where you have to specialize in as a management accountant. So this is basically decision analysis. Right? This is basically decision analysis and this is where uh, you know, the expertise of a management accountant lies, right, in part two. Part one has its own uh, specializations. Now, what I want to tell you at the outset itself is this exam doesn't have any negative corrections. Let me stop the share. Go to a whiteboard. It doesn't have any negative corrections. Just a minute, it's loading. So what do you mean? It means that if you get a question wrong, you would not have your marks minus. Okay, so this means that you have to, you have to answer all the subjects. You have to answer everything. You have, uh, sorry, all the questions. You shouldn't leave any question unanswered. There are about 100 MCQs. 100 MCQs. For which you would be given a three hour period. Three hours for this. And two essays. For which it is one hour. This essay questions would have sub questions in it. Each question might have about four sub questions, which you may have to answer. Do not leave anything unanswered. Of course, there's a challenge here. 100 MCQs in 180 minutes. So if you do a quick math, it is 1.8 minutes per question. Right, 1.8 would work out to 1 minute 48 seconds, if my math is correct. Right, this is far too less to answer a question, is it not? You have seen the kind of questions, probably you have done your homework, you have seen that. I mean, uh, to get 1 minute 48 seconds to answer a question is a pretty daunting task. However, 
it doesn't mean that you should take one minute, 48 seconds for every question. There are some questions, especially in section C, part two. It would take you probably two minutes to read the question itself. The questions would be so lengthy that it will be, it will take about two minutes to read the questions, right? What I would suggest, and listen to me carefully here, because this is all about time management. Okay, I have known people fail because they fail to manage time basically. So what you should do is, you can go up to, let us say, maximum, maximum. I'm talking about maximum. Five minutes for a difficult question. Okay? Do not exceed this at whatever cost because you'll fall short of time later on. Five minutes are maximum for a difficult question. There are going to be difficult questions and easy questions. If you can't get it right, out of A, B, C, D, four choices, mark something. Get a, give an educated guess and mark something, uh, answer something, and then flag the question. When you do the mock test, you'll know what it is flagging. When you flag the question, it means that you have still not completed it, and it will come back, the question will come back, the flag question will come back to you after you finish the paper so that you can spend more time on it and answer it correctly, okay? But again, as I told you, don't leave any question unanswered. Put something and then move on. If you find that the question is going to take you too much of time, now listen carefully to this too. These are all very important tips, okay? I'm telling by experience. If you find a question very tough and you think that it's going to take a lot of time, put something put some answer, flag it, go to the next question, right? There are some very easy questions also. It's not going to be all tough. They're going to be very easy questions and that would have equal weightage as the difficult ones. Do not think that the difficult ones have got more marks than the easy ones. All have equal marks. Is this a surprise to you? Is this something new to you? If it is new, please note it. All the questions have the same marks in a paper. The paper is graded based on degree of difficulty, which I'll come to that later, okay? So an easy question, you go to that, get it right. Probably you would take maybe 48 seconds to answer this. The easy questions, maybe 48, maybe 48 seconds, or sometimes even 10 seconds to answer some easy questions. So this gives you the license to take more time for a difficult question. Again, do not exceed five minutes, five minutes maximum. So now this would make up your average. You should bring down your average to this, otherwise you won't be able to complete the paper. You should bring down your average for to one minute, 48 seconds. Okay, do not spend too much time on a difficult question. Fine. Now, finally, finally, Suppose you have got 10 questions, 10 MCQs, okay? And one minute remaining. Imagine this is your, this is the kind of situation you got caught to, okay? You didn't manage your time well, and now you have one minute. And after this one minute, the session mercilessly closes down. Okay, there's no human being monitoring it, saying that you can you can request for extra time or bribe that person. Tina, can you please mute your mic, please? Okay, so suppose in this situation you have 10, one minute and 10 MCQs. So what are you going to do? If you even read a question, it's going to take up that minute. So do not read any question, right? You have got 10 questions here. Put some answer, maybe A, A, A for everything. Put some answer completely, okay? So uh, do not leave any question unanswered, as I told you. Put some A, A, A. There is a high probability now, if you go by probability, what's the probability of getting a question correct? One out of four, is it not? 
if you know basic probability theory, there is a 25% chance of you getting a question correct if you are going to guess it. Of course, if you know it, your chances are more. But if you are guessing it, 25% chance of you getting it correct. If you leave the question unanswered, there's a 0% chance of you getting it correct. Right? So why do you want to spoil your chances? Put some answer blindly, AA. And I'm telling you, please note, this is only there's if your back is towards the wall, you're trapped. Okay? There's one minute and 10 MCQs. Do not do this for the whole paper. <laughs> then there's a 25% chance you'll pass. Okay? So this is only in a worse come worse situation, in an emergency situation, where there's one minute and 10 MCQs, put down some answer for all the 10 MCQs. And sometimes this might prove, this might make a difference between you passing and failing. The reason being out of 10 questions, if you do the math of 25% probability, how many questions will you get it correct? If you go by the theory of probability, which is sometimes very true, you would get 2.5 questions correct. Now you cannot get a fraction of a question correct. Okay, so your chances of getting a, a question, questions correct, the number of questions correct is three questions. There's a good chance, a 25% chance. So you might get three questions correct. Or if you are a very unlucky person, you will get at least one correct. I don't think there's a person so unlucky to get zero correct, though it's a possibility. Right? There is a possibility, but getting zero correct would be a very, very uh, rare phenomenon. Okay, so you would get at least one question correct if you do this. The least is one question, maximum three, or even it can be more than three. Okay, right? Because probability theory doesn't stick strictly to 25%, but it would hover around 25%. That is the probability theory. Okay, then about essays, do not get carried away and put in too many points. Okay, that's not going to serve any purpose. You would not have time. Read the question, answer in point form, answer in, in uh, at least if you don't have the time, put a one liner to each question. The, the main aim is to attempt everything. Put a one liner, but it should be relevant and to the point. Always connect real world, world world situations to an essay. Real world. Okay. During the CMA sessions, I would be putting newspaper cuttings connected to the CMA syllabus, which is happening in the real world in the current financial affairs. I'd be putting you some stuff on that. Right? As the course goes on. This is going to be very useful for your essay sessions. Believe me, because this is a part which would be corrected by a human being. So there is subjectivity here. You have to impress. And you would impress if your answers are different from the rest. If everybody writes the text, and you also write the text, your chances of beating the others is going to be lesser. So what you should do to impress is to write something different and all, always critically analyze. What do you mean by critically analyze? Okay, suppose they tell you to, uh, to write about the garden's dividend growth model. Okay, so dividend growth model. You'll study this. Okay, describe the model, right? And also mention what could go wrong here. What are the assumptions which are not going to fit into the real world situation? Right? Even though it is used extensively, it has to be taken with a pinch of salt because this is not going to be foolproof theories or foolproof formulas. There's going to be, otherwise everybody would follow a formula and become rich. It's not that way. Right? It's not very easy. So you have to critically analyze it. Everything, all the ratios, they have their drawbacks. All the formulas have got some snag in it. Okay, so you have to take that into consideration when you're working in real life. 
me having corporate experience have experienced the flaws of all the uh, all, most of the theory which we study. Of course, they are applicable, but they do have their flaws. In an essay, you have to point out those flaws for you to, to for you to be a cut above the rest. You want to stand head and shoulders above the rest. That's what you should do. Connect real world situations. Be critical. Yes. One more point. Always practice on computer. Practice on the computer. Use MS Word because the essay format is going to be like MS Word. Okay, so use MS Word. Do not, do not practice with pen and paper. The reason being, you might practice it with pen and paper while you're practicing at home, but in the exam, when you're faced, to, faced with the task of typing in or keying in the, the answers, that's where you'll find difficulty, right? You would find difficulty and the thought flow would not come to you very naturally because you have been practicing with your pen and paper. So always practice the questions, essay questions. There are plenty of model essay questions. Practice the questions by keying in the answers. Keep a clock, see that it doesn't exceed the one hour. See that it doesn't exceed the one hour. Okay. Right. Now, let me tell you something else. Okay. How do I go to the next page? One second. Okay. Just a minute. I want to tell you an important point now. Now, many people may not know this, but, okay, I told you that, I told you that for 100 MCQs, you are going to have three hours. And for two essays, you are going to have one hour, totally four hours, right? Four hours. So, let us say that you manage to complete your essay in two and a half hours. Okay. Then you would get an extra half an hour for your essay, totaling four hours anyway. So in, in the cases where you get you complete it within two hours, you would have two hours for your essay as well. Totaling four hours. Okay. The time. Uh, you finish early, would be carried forward to the essay session. Right? So this is what you should note. Okay? But it's, it's actually quite rare you'll finish early because it is quite time consuming, but it's possible. I know some students who have finished early for the MCQs and gone to the uh, essay. Okay? Another thing, you must be knowing this, if you don't get sufficient amount of questions correct in the MCQs, the essay window will not open. They say it is 50% of the questions that you should get correct. We really don't know how actually IMA values it, but you should get a considerable amount of questions correct for your essay window to open. If the essay window doesn't open, you know your result directly. You don't have to have sleepless night for eight weeks after the exam, you have failed. If the essay window doesn't open, it means that you have not got sufficient multiple choice questions correct. And you won't go to the essay. You cannot attempt any of the essay questions. You have failed. On the other hand, some students are overjoyed that they go to the essay question after getting sufficient multiple choice questions correct. Don't be very complacent. Yes, you have gone to the essay. You will have to wait eight weeks for your result because it takes eight weeks from the end of the month. Eight or six, I'm not sure. I think it's six weeks from the end of the month to get your results. So you will have some restless nights waiting for your results. But don't be complacent that you have passed. 
I have known students during my 10-year teaching career that who have gone to the essay in two or three attempts, but still not cleared the exam. Okay, they have fallen short somewhere. The MCQs were not satisfactory. The essays probably was not properly illustrated. The knowledge was not put, because this is the place where you can demonstrate your knowledge. The essays. So the examiners are looking to see the depth of your knowledge from the essay questions. You have to impress. Again, I told you, it is human corrected. The MCQs are machine corrected. So you, there is no question of unfairness. Right? So if you have got a question correct, it is correct. If you have got it wrong, it is wrong. So there is no question of unfairness. The strategy, the general strategy as per me, is to get as many MCQs correct as possible. Because it says is always a thorn in the flesh. Not very easy to score. Subjective correction, you really don't know exactly what the examiner expects. But I told you, connect real-life situations, be critical, okay? write in a point form, practice on the computer. So these kind of tips I've given you, right? You follow these tips and you will definitely pass, okay? If you, if you have studied also and gone through the classes, follow these tips, you will pass. There's a very good chance for you to pass, okay? Strategy, do as many MCQs as possible in the sense practice more of the MCQs. Okay. I would tell you that 75% of your time, 75% of your time in study should go in solving MCQs. 25% to understand the concepts. And sometimes, sometimes my strategy is to do very less theory. This 25% I will spend very less time, even to make you understand the concept. I would make you try it as much as possible to make you understand the concepts. But I realize by experience is sometimes the concepts are understood while applying it to an MCQ. Right? So when you're doing your MCQ, you would get the concept. So that is when I would teach you the concepts as well while doing the MCQs. So my strategy also is to do as many MCQs as time permits. Here we are, we are, we are running short of time also. I cannot take, you know, I don't have unlimited time with me. Right? So I would be spending some time solving some very good examples, ex very good uh, exam style MCQs and then leave the entire question bank for you to solve. You have to, ultimately you're writing the exam, so you have to get that practice to solve the questions, MCQs. Okay? Practice, 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 and practice. 75% of your time should go solving MCQs. A little bit of time should go solving essays also, but don't be overly worried that you're not practiced for an essay. I'll tell you why. Because while you are doing the MCQs, the MCQs, the essays are an extension of MCQs. So whatever they ask you in the MCQ, sometimes the MCQs are as lengthy as an essay. Okay. So sometimes when you're solving the MCQs, you may have to just describe it more in an essay. That's all. Okay. So you have to give a descriptive answer in an essay. It's an extension of MCQs, but still, do practice essays as well. But 75% of the time should go in solving MCQs. Doing a mock exam before the exam is a must. Is a must. I would suggest don't do too much. You might lose confidence. Keep the best. Keep your best for the exam, for the real exam. The mock exam is for you to check how the system works, how to flag a question, your time management. Okay, do not lose confidence if you don't get to all the questions correct in the mock exam because one thing is the adrenaline is not rushing in just like it would do for the real exam. So you'd be relaxed, probably you'd get up, you'd have a glass of water, or you would have a you'd open the fridge and have something and then do your mock exam. Okay. 
Don't do too many mock exams. That is my suggestion. Do too many MCQs. Okay. So the mock exam, do at least one. That is a must. Fine. That should be done. And then you are all set for the real scenario. Keep the best for the real exam. Okay. That's what chess players also do. You must have heard that the chess players, they don't uh, practice games just before the match. They rest. They rest as much as possible because whatever practice has already been done to the days approaching the match. So you also have put in a lot of hours just before the exam. So do not give too much of time when it's close to the exam in the sense, do not lose sleep. Do not lose sleep. Okay, sleep is very important for you to get your thoughts clear, for you to think clear. So you get maximum sleep just a few days before the exam. Be well rested and do the exam. I've known people who have actually given up towards the end and rested and slept. Okay, they have slept the few days before the exam but passed the exam. Because that rest was very much required for them. Okay, that rest was very much uh, required for them. So that's what you should be aiming at. And uh, yes, so I have given you all the points, right? All the points which you require for the exam. I spent considerable amount of time in telling you this. I'm quite aware of that, right? The reason being, it's very important. This points which I have told you, I hope you would get a recording of this. It's very important for you to pass the exam. It means between passing and failing. Okay. Having said that, now my approach to the to uh, the CME teaching part is, as I told you, to do maximum number of questions as time permits. If I cannot do too many questions, I would do quality questions. Okay, explain the concept for a little while, not too much, just a little bit. Explaining the concept, I would explain the concept while doing the question. And my explanation is not going to be only exam oriented. It's going to be life oriented. It should help you in your interviews as well. Okay, it should help you in your interviews as well. And see you through that. So. I, I actually hate the word formula. I hate it. Because this restricts your thinking. And IMA would set questions so that it doesn't fit into a formula. So if you are applying the formula, you have to understand what is the formula. So I would go without formulas for most of the part. And while explaining and solving the questions by logic, we would be uh, unconsciously following the formula. So I don't want you to consciously follow the formula, not to put down the formula like you've been taught in school. Okay? A plus B, the whole squared is equal to A squared plus B squared plus 2AB and then you fit into it. No. You fit those numbers into it. You should know how we got A plus B, the whole squared. That is the aim. So even if you forget this, you have no problem. You know how to get this formula, right? You will start multiplying, right? You start multiplying and you will get it. So my approach to all the formula driven questions is logic and not formula. Okay. So when you follow the logic, I am making twist and turn. Remember, no question is going to be straightforward for you. However you practice, however the providers have tried to depict the real exam situation, IMA always has got an ace up their sleeve. Something which you are not practiced at all. There's always a surprise. There's always a surprise waiting for you in the exam. Remember that. How much, however you practice. So how do you get rid? How, how, how should you not be surprised? By understanding the logic, the concept not just the formula. When you understand the concept, 
behind it, they can twist and turn the question in any way and you will be able to answer it very well. So this is going to be my approach. Remember, not memorizing, not memorizing. You don't have to memorize anything. What impresses you, you would automatically retain it. Right? So just take, in, uh, just take an example of a classroom. When you join a school or a college, you don't know anybody's name. There might be even 10 students you don't know. Sometimes there are 100 students in the class. You don't know anybody's name. Would you list out all the students and memorize their names? No. As time goes, when you get to know the student, you automatically remember his name without, without even any effort to remember. At the end of the time, the mind's capacity is so much that you will remember all the 100 students' names. Right? So similarly, when you understand the concept, you will remember anything automatically. I want that approach rather than uh, rote learning. Okay, So let's get on with the topic on hand today, which is CMA part two, section A. Okay, CMA part two, section A. Let's close it and reshare it. Part 2, Section A is actually 20% on the exam. Okay, Part 2, Section A is 20% on the exam. Which is basically ratio analysis. Most of it is ratio analysis. Some of it is special issues. Okay, I would say 75% of Part A the main course is ratio analysis. Okay, so that is what it is all about. Right. The first of those ratios which we are going to study. Okay, first of all, we would do horizontal and vertical analysis when we actually start. This is just a master class. Remember, this is a master class. I'm just going to do some. Uh, topics to understand, to give you a feel of how the teaching would go on. Okay. So first of all, we are going to study liquidity ratios. Fine. And then we would go on to leverage and solvency ratios. Okay. Now, what are liquidity ratios and what are solvency ratios? What is the difference between liquidity and what is the difference between solvency? Okay. Now, for example, you have a house. This is your own house. Okay. You're owning your own house. This is you sitting here. Pardon my drawing. Okay. And you have got plenty of money here stacked up. Okay. Now with this money, you can buy, you can, you can lead your daily life. You can buy food. You can pay your electricity bill. Okay. You can have a haircut. You can do so many things with this money here. This is your liquidity to carry on with your day-to-day -day affairs. Okay? So that is your liquidity. Certainly, if you don't have liquidity. Okay, I'm sorry, the part of the house also went off. Okay, you don't have this liquidity. So, let me reconstruct the house. This money is now not there. So, how would you spend for your food? How would you pay your electricity bill? How would you have your hair cut? You cannot do it. Okay? So, you are sort of a, te a technically insolvent here. 
But are you fully bankrupt? No, because you have this house with you. So this is keeping you solvent. This house is keeping you solvent. In the sense, you are not fully bankrupt. You don't have money. You cannot eat. You cannot have a haircut. You cannot pay electricity bill. But you have a house. You can sell part of it. Probably sell this much. Right? Sell it out. Or lease it or do whatever. Okay? <clears throat> So what you do is you will get some money out of this. So if you have to spend, if you have to sell a part of your house in for, for your food, for your electricity bill, for your haircut, it means that you have no liquidity, but you're still solvent. If you don't have a house also, if this house is on rent, then you're bankrupt. You don't have liquidity, neither are you solvent. Okay, so solvency is more long-term to meet your long-term needs as well. Whereas liquidity is more short-term to keep you afloat, to keep you afloat for your day-to-day -day expenses and to pay your current liabilities. Okay, now how do we test these ratios? How do you test your liquidity position and your solvency position. For that, they have recommended some ratios. You can be innovative and do your own ratios. Okay, you can be quite innovative and do your own ratios. But however, there is some recommended ratios which we will be doing it now. The first of those ratios is the current ratio. Current ratio is current assets. I'm putting a short form there. By the current liabilities, divided by current liabilities. Now you don't have to memorize here. Because the word current mentions that everything current should be put in the numerator and the denominator. What is current? Which can be converted into cash or cash equivalents in one year's time. There is also an operating cycle part to it. I'll come to that later. For the moment, just remember that anything that can be converted to cash within a year. One year is the usual accounting period. And most operating cycles are within one year. So one year, let us keep it for the moment. I'll explain the operating cycle part later. And what are current liabilities? Everything what you owe, that has to be paid within a year. So that is the thing. So it's all, again, a liquidity ratio because it's looking at the short-term viability of the firm. So what are current assets here? Inventory which should usually get converted in a year to cash, accounts receivable, okay, then anything current, anything current, any asset which is current, okay, there may be financial assets, a loans, for example, a loan granted which is due within a year, this is a loan granted, okay, which is due within a year, and then Cash, marketable securities, which is as good as cash, right? And also prepaid expenses, which will be consumed within a year. That means you would use it. You pay the rent for a year, you would use it up. Current liability is what is going to be paid within a year using the current assets. Using the current assets. So, what is it? Maybe salaries payable. You would have accrued the salary. So this is accrual, you can say. And then a free credit, which most of the small firms enjoy, and even large firms enjoy, is accounts payable. I'm putting a shortened form. So please listen to what I say. It's accounts receivable, accounts payable. 
Okay. So accounts payable are suppliers basically which have to be paid within a year. And then what else you have? You have tax payables, which you accrued and it has to be paid within the year. You have got a current portion of a long-term loan. Anything more than a year, which has to be paid after a year is long-term. So current portion of a long-term loan will also be included in the denominator. Okay, now you would gauge your liquidity position. Suppose you have current assets worth 100, let us say. Maybe 100,000, 100 million, whatever. Okay, so 100. And current liabilities, let us say 50. Your ratio is 2 is to 1. That means you can have some comfort here that your current assets would be sufficient to cover your current liabilities. But again, don't be too bogged down by the numbers. That is the biggest mistake I have learned while being while working practically. I've worked out a current ratio blindly when I was young and just come out of uh, my qualifications and gone into the real world scenario. And I had to work out some ratios for my boss and he asked me my opinion. I'd say, okay, I work out the numbers without looking at the quality or the story behind the numbers and tell him, wow, this is a great situation. Don't worry, sir, you are well off. Okay, that you can cover your current liabilities. And then surprisingly, at the end of a period or during the period, we are falling short of cash. We are finding that, uh, you know, accounts payable, uh, urgent ones are we are not able to pay them or we paid the salaries that we cannot pay keep it pending we don't have money for taxes or to pay the current portion of the long-term accruals or uh, loans why does this happen because we are not gone to the story behind the numbers so always look at the quality of the current assets is this inventory moving are these accounts receivable paying Okay, are these accounts receivable paying? And uh, one second, right? Are these accounts receivable paying? Will this loan that you are granted to somebody would they pay? Do you have enough cash? Are the marketable securities marketable? Can they be sold in the short term without any loss of a market value? Prepaid expenses, of course, are generally not available to pay off your current liabilities, but you would be using them and they would actually reduce your liabilities. So that way you should look at it. Okay. So then look at the urgencies of the current liabilities also. Tax payable and salaries are very urgent. Some of the accounts payable can be prioritized. You don't have to pay everything at once. The current portion of the loan would become an urgent issue because otherwise uh, they might, you know, go into legal action, right? So these are the things you should be studying the story behind the numbers. If you are slow moving inventory, do not boldly report this figure. Adjust the in, uh, numerator, adjust the numerator and then report realistic figures. This I'm telling you when you are in a job situation. Okay, when you have to advise the management. In the CM exam, you would be just showing these figures. But they would very rarely ask you just to compute the current ratio. Okay, or the quick ratio, as which I'll be doing next. They would ask you something else, the sensitivities of these ratios, which I'll come to later. Okay, now let me... Let me go to the next board. One minute. This is not working. So that was about the current ratio. 
Now there is one more liquidity ratio, which is more stringent, more strict. Like you have strict corrections, right? The current ratio was a little more lenient. It would show you a bigger number, right? We got the current ratio. If you remember, we got the current ratio of two is to one with my own example of 100 by 50, right? 100 being the current assets, 50 being the current liability. Now, the quick ratio. Now, in the quick ratio, what happens? Like the name suggests, you are going to correct, you are going to consider quick assets. It will be current assets, no doubt about it. It will not be uh, converted in the current year itself, but it will be more quicker. So what we do is we exclude inventory. We exclude inventory and include AR. Why do we exclude inventory? Because inventory is not so quick. Inventory would become AR and AR would become cash. So there's two steps away from cash. Whereas AR, accounts receivable, is just a step away from cash. So we include that because it is quick. Right? We want a more stricter ratio. And then this, we would include cash. No prepaid, because prepaid is never uh, available for, uh, for paying the current liabilities. Okay, So cash and cash equivalents, which is marketable securities. And anything else which is very quickly converted into cash. Okay, Then... The current liabilities will be the same as you got in the current ratio. That part is the same. So the salary is payable, the current portion of the loans, okay, tax payable, all that is the same. Now, when the current ratio was 100 by 50, you can expect the quick ratio to be a tighter number, maybe 75 by 50. 75 by 50. Okay, this is giving you a more tighter number. So that is going to give you, instead of 2 is to 1, 1 1.5 is to 1. If you ask me, I would report this figure for my liquidity ratios. In fact, the bank, when you take a loan, the bank looks at your quick ratio. It looks at your quick ratio, mainly. Because I have this experience with uh, banks like HSBC, etc. They look at your quick ratio. Then there is a more stringent ratio called the cash ratio. I'll put the full form. Otherwise, you will think it as current ratio. Okay. Now, the cash ratio, like the name suggests, would even go to the extent of not including AR. Only cash plus marketable securities divided by the current liabilities is the same. There's not going to be any change in the current liabilities. So the current liabilities, I'll put it the same. So this is what it's going to be. Cash plus marketable securities divided by the current liabilities. You will get a smaller number than this because you're excluded AR. So you'd get probably 50 by 50, which is equal to 1 is to 1. If you have this figure sufficient to pay your liabilities, not less than 1, I suppose you can safely say if there is no restricted cash here, all the cash is free cash, I suppose now you can freely say that you can pay your liabilities. If you maintain a 1 is to 1 cash ratio. If you maintain a 2 is to 1 or even 5 is to 1 current ratio, we do not have the guarantee that we would be safe with our current liabilities. We can pay our current liabilities on time. You cannot have a guarantee. Even the quick ratio, what if the receivables do not pay on time? Then you are in a crunch again. But cash ratio, you are dealing with cash right? You're dealing with cash. So you have the cash already to you. But again, it should not be restricted cash. What if this some of this cash is for investing? Maybe you have to invest long term. 
Okay, maybe you have to invest in an asset. Then you cannot use that cash to pay off your current liabilities. So you should take that into consideration. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Somebody is asking me the question. Uh, it vanished. I don't know how to see it again. Uh, can you put that question again? Somebody asked me the question. Oh, it's here, the chat. Yeah. Why do we include marketable securities in the cash ratio instead of only cash? Because let me tell you, marketable securities is as good as cash. Okay. They can be sold in the short term, just like if you have your dollars, you can go to the exchange and just exchange it to cash, to rupees, is it not? It's that easy. You can, you can change it to cash. You can sell it into cash at the market price in a short period of time. It's not like a building. Suppose you have a, uh, if you have a, uh, let us say, apartment. Can you sell your apartment in a short time? Maybe it's worth 60 lakhs. The market value is 60 lakhs. Okay, nowadays apartments you do not get for 60 lakhs. It's all very expensive, but in a good area, you will not get it. But 60 lakhs somewhere in the outskirts. Can you sell it immediately? No, you cannot. You'll have to struggle. Okay, then what about your liabilities that they might suffer? Suppose you have to pay your salaries and you're waiting to sell your apartment. You cannot. But marketable security is not like that. You can sell it over the counter. Go to your broker. There'll be some bonds, etc., and you can sell it at market price with with actually uh, very less loss of market value. Okay, right. Of course, you want to make your apartment very liquid. You can make it very liquid. I'll tell you how. The sixty lakhs apartment, sell it for two lakhs. Even I will queue up to buy your apartment immediately. I'll, I'll send the money from here. Okay. So what, what is it here? This means that there's a significant drop in market value. So liquidity is selling something in the very short term without significant loss of market value. That's the most important thing. Okay. So marketable security is as good as cash. You will get a, if this figure is going to cover your current liabilities, that is, it's not less than one, then I suppose you are in a safe position. That's all the theory I'm going to tell you about. Now, everything else is going to be application. And you'll see that application is not just computing these ratios. Okay. So now let us go to the questions directly. Let us go to the questions directly. Now, when I give you questions, I would give you some time for you to solve it. Okay. Even when the classes start, I'm not just going to go blindly. I want you to engage. I may not give you a lot of time because time is important, but I'll give you some time to do it on your own. And once you do it on your own, you're fully involved and engaged. Then I will tell you how to do it. Okay, if you get it or not, if you get the answer, do not pause your uh, session and then go and have something from the fridge. No, listen to my explanation, even if you have got it correct. Because the MCQs is the mode where I would be explaining the concepts. So bear that in mind, okay? So now let's go on. I'll share my screen and go to the MCQs. Can everybody see it? Just somebody say yes or no. You can, you, uh, is, it, is everything visible? I, I take it, yes. Okay, there's a chat there. Yes, Rakshit and this one said yes, correct. Fine, go ahead and solve this question. I would time you. I'll give you only two minutes. 1.48 is allowed. I'll give you only two minutes. Okay, to solve this. If you get it or not, it doesn't matter. Attempt should be there. Okay, attempt should be there. Please do that. I'll pause my video and my audio and give you time. 
you can put in your answers in the chat box. Karan says C. Anybody else? Sonia also C. One more minute. Okay, your time is up. Let me solve it. The answer, unfortunately, is not C. Okay. See, so first of all, what you should do is look at the ratio in the beginning. It is 400 current assets, 500 current liabilities, 0.8 is the current ratio. 0.8 is to 1. Okay, now test for each one of the choices. The ratio should increase as a result of the transaction. Now, this kind of questions, this kind of questions is actually called sensitivity questions. It's the favorite of a CMA. Okay, and liquidity ratios is a guarantee question in the exam. Okay, it's a definite question. Uh, maybe they would not ask you profitability. Maybe they would not ask you solvency. But liquidity, generally, they do ask and sometimes in an essay as well. Okay. So you started off with 0.8. Now you should know when you do financial analysis, you should be well versed with accounting as well. A purchase of inventory on account. What do you mean on, on account? It is on credit. Purchase of inventory on credit would have an accounting entry. You should be very familiar with the journal entries. So you would have debit, inventory, 100,000. I'm going to truncate the zeros. I'm not going to put all the zeros. And credit, accounts payable, a liability 100. Why? Because it's on credit, on account. So this would add something to the numerator, which is inventory, and accounts payable to the denominator, making it 500 by 600. So 500 by 600 is 0.833. It has increased from 0 0.80 to 0 0.833. That's all. That's the answer. It has to increase. That's all. So A is the right answer. And why do they test this so much? in the CMA exams. They are testing it because in practical life, you may have to advise the management some transaction to boost your ratio. Because sometimes when you take a loan, the bank expects you to have a certain amount of liquidity ratio. 0.8, as you see, the liquidity ratio is bad. Okay, It's not going to cover your current liabilities. If the current ratio is 0.8, the cash ratio and AR, I mean liquidity ratio, quick ratio, would be even more lesser. So this is not a favorable position. The bank might look up on, look down upon it. So you are under pressure to boost the ratio. The manager might come and ask you, what's your idea? How do you boost it? So you're going to advise the manager when such situations come, purchase inventory on account and it would boost it. Even though slight, it might boost the ratio. Okay. Anyway, you need inventory, so buy it on account. So, will it always boost the ratio? Anybody? Can you, will you, if you have appointed today as a management accountant and your ratio is falling short of the standards, would you advise the manager or the your boss to purchase inventory on account and it would boost the ratio? Would you do that? Anybody? You saw it. It just now boosted the ratio, is it not? So would you give a blind recommendation to the manager 
without even checking anything that to purchase inventory on account and it would boost the ratio. Yeah, not always. You'll see something very strange here. Now I will show it to you. I'll clear everything. Now suppose the ratio instead of being 400 by 500, was let us say the other way about. Current assets, 500. And current liabilities, 400. So you are already having a healthy ratio. Okay? Sort of healthy. Depends again on the industry. There's no norm. So 1.25 is to 1. Now if you purchase inventory, you know the entry. Debit inventory. So inventory would come in the current assets. And accounts payable will come in the current liabilities. Now you would have 600 by 500. Okay, you have 600 by 500. It is 1.2 is to 1. Now, what happened here? It dropped. Right? Last time, when it was 400 by 500, it increased. When it is 500 by 400, it dropped. So, you cannot blindly recommend. If you do this, you will lose your job. Okay, you cannot blindly recommend to your manager that, uh, uh, you know, you cannot blindly recommend to the manager that go ahead and purchase inventory on account. Okay, why is this reason? Why? I will tell you the reason behind this, uh, this puzzle. Okay, why do you think you should, why is this difference? See, when it was 400 on 500, when you added 100 to the numerator for inventory, you added 100, is it not? When 100 is added here, the addition is 100 over 400. Okay. So, in other words, there is a 25% increase in the numerator. And 100 is also added in the denominator. But the impact on the denominator is lesser. It is how much? 100 divided by 500. The denominator increased by only 20%. See, if the denominator increases more, the ratio will drop. If the denominator increases less, the ratio is increasing. So now the denominator increased by 25%. I mean, sorry, numerator increased by 25%, but the denominator increased by a lesser percentage. That's why the ratio went up from 0.8 to 0.833. That's the reason. Okay, that is the science behind it. Okay, now, when it was the other way about, when 500 was the current assets, and 400 was the current liability. The addition to the numerator was 20%. The impact on the numerator was less than the impact on the denominator. So numerator increased by 20% and denominator increased 100 over that 400 is a 25% increase. Since the denominator increased, when the denominator increases, you know by basic math, when denominator increases, the ratio would drop. So that is why the ratio went down from 1.25 to 1.2. Because the denominator increased at a higher rate. So the impact on the denominator was more than the numerator. That is the reason. A is the right answer. It would not always be the case. You have to check it. Okay. Now, let us look at the wrong answers. Always for a number question, look at, uh, I mean, for most of the questions, you should look at the wrong answers as well. Okay. Right. So, uh, especially for word kind of questions, you have to look at the wrong answers and see why they are wrong. Now, can anybody tell me why B is not the answer and what effect would B have on the current ratio? Can anybody tell me that? 
I would erase everything else, make it clear. A is the right answer, but we are analyzing the wrong answers. Why is B not the correct answer? What would be the effect of B, transaction B, on the current ratio? Anybody can tell me? Yeah, there is a chat message. It would increase the denom numerator. No, it would decrease the numerator is not correct at all. Nope. No change is correct. Now see, it's like this. You have 400, right? Let me explain to you, okay? See, here again, I might take a long time to explain a question because I would explain all the, all the parts of it. You should be 100% sure so that the other questions I may not have to explain so much. You will know it already, okay? So suppose 400 is the current assets and 500. They have told you that, okay? They have told you that 400 and 500 which is 0.8. Okay, now let us say that 400 is equal to, uh, let us let us say that you have inventory also, okay, because it's a current ratio. Inventory, let us say 100. And let us say AR was 300. Okay, that is making it 400, is it not? And let's say current liability accounts payable was 500. Okay, now when you collect cash, for accounts receivable, the entry is going to be, again, you should know the entry is like the back of your hand. Debit cash, 300. Let me put everything is collected. Credit accounts receivable, 300. Accounts receivable will decrease. But at the same time, cash is increasing. So what happens here, the result of this would be as following. The inventory would be the same. 100, AR would now become zero because it is collected. But you would have cash and cash is the part of current ratio. And still the numerator is going to be 400. Denominator did not change at all. We did not pay any accounts payable. Okay, so still you have 400 by 500 this would bring out not an increase, not a decrease. There is no change. I hope that's clear. I hope that is clear with you. All, everybody understand that, okay? You should understand what's happening. Any doubts, anybody? I'll take some time, chat with y'all. If you're finding the class, okay, you can understand. Am I going too fast, too slow? I want you to tell me that part of it. Is it all clear? Are you concentrating being a weekend or you are relaxing with some food and tea and coffee or whatever? Is everything clear? Understandable? Okay, fine. That's good. If you are in doubt, put a question. Okay, put a question on the chat. I would check it. It would pop up and I would answer it. Okay, right. Uh, it's going to be, the classes are going to be pretty detailed. I'm going to not, uh, I, I, actually, I, for professionals who are in this group, there might be some CA, ICWAs, or, you know, some people who have done their CFA and they want to do their CMA, there might be. You guys would find my explanation quite boring because I'm not going to leave any anything, any stone unturned. I'm going to explain in very great detail, okay? So that's why some people might find it boring. I cannot help it. I'm here to teach people who don't understand at all. So that's my attempt, okay? Though I would not be going to the very, very basics, but I'd be going pretty detailed, okay? So uh, you will have to bear with me if you find my explanations lengthy and long and very detailed, okay? Right, now let us go on to the, to see. What is the effect here? Now you have 400 by 500 to start off with. That is 0.8 is to one, okay? So that is the ratio you have to start off with, okay? Now,
if you pay an accounts payable, there's going to be a reduction. Yeah, somebody said something. I want to check that. The ratio will decrease as cash and accounts payable both will decrease. Now, that is quite an explanation, but let me explain in a, in a more detailed way. You would actually, the entry is going to be debit AP. I'm going to put your accounting entries, if you like it or not. Some people are allergic to accounting entries. But this is the basis of financial management. You should know accounting. You should know the double entry system of accounting. And credit cash, 100. Now, the credit cash would reduce the numerator, but the same amount is going to be reduced in the denominator as well because the liability is getting reduced. So you are left with 300 by 400, which is equal to 0.75. It reduced. It reduced. Okay. So that's what happened. If you analyze it this way, put down the figures. If they have not given you figures, you have to assume some figures and put it down. Okay. Now, for example, in this question, they're told the quick assets exceeds the current liabilities. So you can, you can imagine some figures. They do not give you exactly 400 by 500, but you can imagine some figures, but the numerator should be more than the denominator in that case, in the question second, in the second question case. Okay, now you would advise your manager. You would tell him that if your ratio is bad, do not pay any accounts payable because that would make your ratio worse. Please do not pay it. You would advise that to the manager, to your boss when you are at work. Am I right? That's what you will do, right? Rakshit? Sonia, Karen, what would you advise your manager? Do not pay accounts payable when the ratio is point or, you know, it's bad. Or even if it is any kind of ratio, do not pay. It will deteriorate the ratio, right? For any kind of ratio, current ratio, for whatever current ratio, do not pay accounts payable. Well, Yola said, yes, if you tell your manager that, you would lose your job. <laughs> okay, because it's not going to be always the case. Be very careful when you are advising the management. Now, look at the ratio differently. Now, suppose if the ratio was 500 by 400, 500 current assets, the other way about, current liability is 400. Now, if you pay accounts payable, cash would reduce from the numerator. And, okay, here 500 by 400 is again 1.25. And actually, uh, current liabilities would reduce from the denominator, so it would become 300, right? 100, 100 would reduce in both numerator and denominator. Now, suddenly we got 1.33. It has gone up. We paid accounts payable and it went up. So, we cannot advise the manager that paying accounts payable is always going to be bad. It depends on how we started off on the ratio. Why is this happening? Let me just tell you. Again, it's the same reason. When it was 400 by 500, the numerator reduced by 100 out of 400. They had 400 out of that, 400 was reduced. Numerator reduced by 25%. And denominator reduced by 100 by 500, 20%. When the numerator reduces more, the ratio will drop. That's why the ratio went from 0.8 to 0.75 because the reduction in the numerator was more than the reduction in the denominator. The pinch, the impact was more than the impact on the denominator. It's like this. You see, 
uh, for example, uh, I'll ask you guys, is one lakh a lot of money to you? Is one lakh a lot of money to you? If you say no, I'll tell you to, uh, I'll say send you my bank details and tell you to transfer one lakh immediately to me. <laughs> okay. Yes, 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 yes. It's a lot of money, right? It's a lot of money. Of course, your entire course might be costing you more than that, but still it's a major fee of your course, right? One lakh is a lot of money. You're feeling the pinch. Now, what about the same one lakh? Okay, one lakh rupees we are talking about to Bill Gates. Ambani, okay, and all these guys. What is their view on this one lakh? It would impact them less, is it not? They're not so affected, right? So similarly with these ratios, the numerator is more sensitive because the numerator was less. You are sensitive to 100,000 because you have less money than Ambani. I'm assuming some of you guys might be quite rich, okay? But I am assuming that you are less rich. You and me are less rich than Ambani or Bill Gates. So this money affects us more. Similarly, when the numerator is lesser, the impact is more. It affects the numerator more. So the numerator is going down by 25%. And when the numerator goes down, the ratio goes down. Well, the denominator has got a little more money. So the impact on the denominator is lesser. So that is why the ratio is going down. You understand? Okay, I hope you understood now with this example. Okay, so you are more sensitive to 1 lakh than Ambani. So similarly, the numerator is more sensitive to 100,000 than the denominator. Now look at the other way about. When it was 500 by 400, the denominator reduced by only 20%. 100 out of 500. So there was a reduction of 20% in the numerator. The denominator reduced. Here the denominator is reducing. Don't forget about that. When accounts payable is paid, the denominator is reducing. The denominator reduced by 25%. The denominator reduced by a higher percentage. When denominator reduces, the ratio goes up. So it went up from 1.2 to 1.2. Okay, so that is what determines the sensitivity. What was the ratio to start off with? If you are in doubt, always put some imaginary numbers and work it out. Here you don't have to imagine numbers because they've given you all the numbers. Okay. So that is why C is wrong. C reduces the ratio. Okay. They want an increase. Now, what about refinancing a long-term loan with a short-term debt? What do you mean by this? You mean that you're taking a long-term loan to pay off a short-term debt. Okay, you're taking a long-term loan to pay off a short-term debt. So that's what it means. So what happens then? Refinancing, no, sorry, sorry. It's the other way about refinancing a long term loan with short term debt. That means you're taking a short term debt. Sorry, I'm sorry about that by mistake. You're taking a short term debt to pay off a long term loan. Okay, so you're replacing the long term loan with a short term debt. In other words, when you had 400 by 500, or 0.8, what you are doing is you are creating a short-term debt. So you will take a short-term debt, short-term loan, 100,000. A liability increases, but with that you are paying off the long-term debt. So long-term loan is extinguished, it's debited. Okay. Right, so I don't know why anybody would do this, 
but this is the situation they're given here. So what would happen here is the numerator would be remain unchanged. The denominator, because the numerator, just it's a debit of a long-term liability. You're extinguishing a long-term liability. Okay. But since the short-term loan is increasing, the 500 becomes 600. Okay. And then numerator remaining the same, it gives you a 0.67 it reduces the ratio drastically without touching the numerator the denominator is reducing drastically okay so that is the effect of refinancing a long term loan with a short term debt is that clear so that is why this is not the answer it reduces it this is not the answer it reduces it here there is no change and here there is an increase in the current ratio. So A is the right answer. Everybody good on this? All aspects of this understood? Say a quick yes or no, please. All parts of this understood? Okay, okay, fine. Right, now let's go on to the next question. I will not do just the second one. I have a better question for you. Something to think over. All right. Question number. Question number. Uh, not four. Question number five. Question number five. I give you two minutes. I pause my video and audio and give you two minutes, right, to solve this question. And then I will solve it. Current says C. Anybody else? Question number five. Rakshit also says C. But why not A? Because last time when we purchased inventory on open account, the ratio did increase, is it not? So why not A? Why is it C? No, cash also reduces is not the issue. Last time also cash reduced. No, cash last time, uh, purchase of inventory it was on account. Cash is not reducing. Cash is not reducing. That's not the reason. Okay, let us test it. First of all, this is the most important line in the question. It has a current ratio of 2 is to 1. No, CA increasing the same as CL is not the question. The sensitivity is the question. Now, so we have a current ratio of 2 is to 1. So let us imagine 200 by 100. Let us purchase inventory on account. Let us say 100,000 like before. The entry would be debit inventory 100. Since it's an open account, it's on credit. The credit accounts payable 100. So what would happen here is this would become, now first of all, it's 2 is to 1, is it not? This would become 300 because inventory is getting added. Open account and on account is the same, which everything the same. Okay. 200 becomes 300 and 100 becomes 200. Because accounts payable is increasing, inventory is increasing. Numerator and denominator both are increasing, but the ratio drops. It doesn't increase. The reason being, since it is 200 by 100, the impact on the numerator is 50%. So there's a 50% increase in the numerator. But the impact on the denominator is more. 
100 is added to the denominator which already had 100. So it is 100 percent. The denominator when it increases more than the numerator, the ratio drops. That is why the ratio dropped. You understood? That's why the ratio dropped, not because of anything else. Now, if it was the other way about, let us say the current, let us say, let us assume, okay, the current assets was 100, current liabilities was, let us say, no, let us say 200. The other way, I reversed it. So now it is 0.5. Now if you purchase inventory on account, numerator gets added by 100, it becomes 200, denominator would be 300. And you would find that the ratio has increased. It has not dropped. It has increased. The reason being, now there is a 100% increase in the numerator. And only a 50% increase, only a 50% increase in the denominator. Since the numerator increased by a greater percentage than the denominator, the ratio went up. You understand? So that is how it works. So A is not the answer because, because uh, the ratio goes down as you saw. Okay? Right. So this is not the answer. Company wrote off an uncollectible receivable. Now, can anybody tell me what effect this would have on the current ratio? What effect would this have on the current ratio? Can anybody tell me? Nope. CA would not because the uncollectible receivable would be written off using the allowance method. You see, always there would not be a direct write-off. Direct write-off is not gap. Okay, you cannot just remove a receivable. You create a provision first. This will be AR. Then there will be an allowance for AR. Have you heard about this? Allowance for AR let us say 50. Okay. This allowance is for keeping aside something which may not be collected. Okay. Not exactly a contingency. Okay. You can say in a way it's a contingency. So you accrue it. Okay. It may not be collected. So we, we provide for it. How do we provide for this? In some previous period, we would debit bad debt expense 50 and credit this allowance. That means you're taking some money out of the profits and creating an allowance, which will be shown like this as a contra asset in the balance sheet. So your AR will be showing only 50. Okay. And when you write off, you use this allowance to write off the receivable. How do you write off? Write off is removing the receivable. So you'll credit AR, 50. You're removing it, right? So you're removing an asset, you credit it. And you will debit. You will not debit bad debt expense, which goes to the income statement, because you've already done that in a previous period. You would debit this allowance. You're making use of that allowance, 50. So as a result, AR from 100, since you removed 50, the balance will be 50. And allowance, since it was a credit balance, you debited it, it would become zero. And your net AR, this is your net AR, would still remain the same. There is no change. The net AR would remain the same. So, company writing off an uncollectible receivable with provision. It's obviously assumed that provision is used. There is going to be no change in the ratio. There's going to be no change in the ratio. 
Now sold merchandise on open account, on credit, and earn a normal gross margin. Now, many of you all told me C is the answer. Can you tell me why C is the answer? Why C is the answer? I remember Karan told me it is C. And uh, Rakshit also, I think, told me C. I'm not sure. Anyway, whoever told me C is the answer, tell me why, please. No. See, what has happened here is it's a current ratio. So gross margin is increasing. So what happens? Why does the current ratio increase? Say it's a current current assets. Let us say the current assets has inventory and AR. Just as let us assume only these two. Let us say inventory was 100, 100. AR was 100. So that makes it 200. And let us say liabilities, liabilities was 100. Current liabilities, 100. Okay. Now, when you sold this inventory and got a profit, that means you sold this inventory for 120. Let us assume the 20 as the profit. No, it is no cash. Cash does not increase because it's an open account. Receivable will increase. So when they sold this for 120, what happens is the inventory now becomes zero because they sold this entire 100. The AR, which was 100, this amount gets added to the AR. It becomes now 220. 100, which was already there, and 120, what they sold, the inventory for a normal gross margin. So now the numerator from 200, it becomes 220 and the liability is not affected, 100. So the ratio would become 2.2, the ratio would increase. C is the right answer. C is the right answer. Now, a previously declared stock dividend was distributed. Now, many of you all may not understand this because stock dividend is not yet been done for you. Okay, stock dividend is not done. But just to remember, stock dividend does not have anything going out of the company. It's a debit to retained earnings. Okay, and credit to, to, to actually common stock. So nothing is going out, neither cash, neither a liability is created or neither an asset is lost. It has no effect. This account has, this entry has got no effect on the current ratio. Because stock dividend, nothing goes out of the company. No resources are going out. No cash is going out, no liability is created, no assets are created. Okay, so there is no effect. I've given you a very brief explanation of D because more explanation has to be given on stock dividend, which I will be doing in the coming classes. Okay, so that's why I gave you a very small uh, uh, explanation on, on D. So as you know, the answer is going to be C. So this is going to be my approach Okay, we have very detailed approach on how to teach you or how to give you the coaching required to pass the CMA exam. Okay, and if you follow my coaching and you ask proper questions, you have to concentrate, of course, right? Many, much of the effort should come from your side. It doesn't depend wholly on the person teaching you. So, what would happen is, if you follow those instructions, those initial instructions which I gave you during the start of the session and follow all the questions. And again, I forgot to tell you this. Three hours of consistent study every day is required. No weekends. Okay, I don't know. For some people, weekends might help to relax them and to get them charged. 
but I would suggest that do it daily. Study less. Probably I am the only faculty in the world who is telling you to study less. I am telling you not to overdo it, but do little, but do it daily. Once you do that, follow the classes properly, concentrate on it, work out your multiple choice questions. There's no way you can fail. Because I'll be teaching, I'll be going through a very detailed way for all the questions. And additionally, if you are in doubt while, while solving the questions from the, uh, from the MCQ question bank, you can send me the question and I will help you in solving it if you are in genuine doubt. If you have watched the videos and then not been able to answer, I would help you on that as well. Okay. So with that, I think I would end the session. Wish you all the best if you are joining and you will meet me on the 13th of this month if you are joining the course.